day, I, am, I feel that I am a very, very proud man who has achieved self-actualization. So I think I am the only person who has been able to work in all these areas in the army. And there was no kind of allegation even to date from any part of the world about the Eastern operation. That operation, the master plan was presented by me. There are many crucial moments and times that I have been able to do my duty for the best interest of the country. On the 9th of January 2015, when there was a change of uh, government, that night also I was able to play a crucial role and maintain democracy in this country. National security and development must go hand in hand. It is not the military getting politicized, no, it is not so. General Dayaratna, the former army commander of, of the Sri Lanka Army, who was over 36 years of service in the Sri Lankan Army, uh, and the most decorated army officer since uh, the establishment of the Sri Lanka Army. Uh, we welcome you, General, to an interview with the Daily Mirror print and Daily Mirror online section. To start off with General, uh, since you've retired, what does it uh, feel like today? I feel very proud that uh, from Objective Day to reach the highest rank of the army, one thing, and being the was uh, degraded of uh, the amount of experience that we have gained, the knowledge that we have gained, the service that we have rendered to the nation. When you think all of those, and I feel that I am a very proud man today. And when you are leaving, of course, you feel uh, uh, something. It is uh, that is a natural, a normal thing. And but uh, I am sure that I will get over all that. And uh, generally, if you can run us through your your career in the army. Uh 36 years of, of, uh, of experience and nine gallantry awards. Uh, in while you were at the army, if you could run us through some of the most memorable moments. Uh, yeah, that is in all respect. It is not only one. And military is a huge organization. It's a reflection of the country, and that there are many areas. So I'm one person who has uh, worked in almost all the areas. I think I'm the only person who has been able to work in all these areas in the army. And all the important as uh, all segment of the army have been able to serve uh, during my tenure uh, in the military. So these are unique achievements actually. Then uh, you mentioned about the uh, gallantry medals. I am uh, a recipient of uh, nine gallantry medals, and uh, the first time in the history, not only within the army and uh, within the entire service of the Sri Lanka Army, I am the highest decorated officer. And uh, that is also a unique achievement. And also, I am one, the one, the only, one and only person who has received uh, gallantry medals from all executive presidents of this country, except the new president. So that is also a unique uh, achievement. And there are other <coughs> instances where uh, there was a very crucial moment in the history of our country, like uh, while Jaffna was falling, and we. I was able to play a very key role. Then Jaffna was to capture, and before capturing, there was a very crucial moment, uh, crucial discussions. Uh, in those discussions, I was able to uh, make an impact. This was in the year? General? In 1995. 1995. And uh, then this is a unique moment. Then uh, towards nine, the uh, nine, uh, end of uh, 1999, there was another crucial period uh, in the history of our army. Uh, in Jais, during the Jayashikuru operation, there was a crucial moment and that moment also I was able to um, get involved in changing the uh, history of this country. And uh, on the 9th of uh, uh, January 2015, when there was a change of government, that night also I was able to play a crucial role democracy in this country. You actually fast track my next question, but I'll, before I come to that, General, if you could run us through during the last phases of the war, what, what was your role? Uh... Uh, you know, the phase of the war started in the East. The humanitarian operation master plan came from me. Then uh, <coughs> that was uh, presented to the Security Council and I am the one who presented the uh, plan of the uh, liberation of the East and uh, I am the one who uh, implemented it and also manage it uh, till the end of the uh, Eastern operation. So these are unique uh, moments and there was no kind of allegation even to date 
from any part of the world, any part of the with the human rights or any other uh, interested groups, there is no allegation at all uh, about the Eastern operation. So <laughs> these are. Uh, so I was uh, able to achieve these things for the country. Uh, General, uh, you brought me to the to the next question. Actually, uh, there you spoke about the election night, the, the shift in democracy, and this is one question that that uh, many people have uh, have re risen all along. They've raised it all along. What exactly happened that night, General? Now, in order to answer this question, actually, you have to understand uh, the, the situation, the pre-election situation. There were a lot of allegations by the opposition, there were a lot of allegations by various interested parties that the military was going to get involved in disrupting the election, especially in the North and East. That was one allegation. Then uh, the other main allegation was that uh, government which was in power that time, if they, even if they were to lose, not to hand over the power, that was another uh, allegation. So we uh, amply cleared that before the election. We, uh, through various media, we uh, said there's nothing like that. But still, people, some people, segment of the society, uh, some politicians did not believe this. So when the election was over on the eighth evening, they realized there was nothing, and 80% of the people voted uh, without any problem. This uh, time, the election became one of the unique elections as far as the violence and other things are concerned. So the credit came to the military, then the government was in power, losing. So then everybody thought that the military was going to take over and a lot of people were giving calls and things like that. And uh, myself and the security guard, other three uh, chiefs, the police chief and the chief of defense staff were summoned to the uh, temple. What time? At about what time was this? That was around 2 o'clock in the morning. So actually that is that became a good thing for the country because we were there and we saw a lot of people. They were a little upset and uh, a large number of people, they were some people were emotional. But we are uh, people who are trained uh, to face this kind of situations. Our life is basically structured, trained and equipped. We are to face uh, this kind of complex emotional moments. So we were quite normal. All our five senses were working very well and we had uh, uh, best um, uh, free mind at that time. So we could be able to manage the situation. Were you summoned by the President General? Who called you? It, uh, no, it was not by the President and we were asked to go there by Chief of Defence Staff. And uh, we went there. I suggested to the um, Secretary, to the AG, to give a uh, press release saying that there is no problem, the handing of our power by the Excellency is according to the people's wish and he is going to apply that. There was a message went round. Uh, then there was, uh, I suggested to the Secretary uh, to uh, invite uh, the opposition, then opposition leader Mr. Ranil Prince, to come there and that was accepted and they discussed uh, the <coughs> transition of uh, power. So all that happened and then to take legal advice, I saw legal experts came. And things like that uh, happened. So, was there at no point uh, a call for a coup or a call for to retain these power? All, <laughs> these all fabricated things. There was nothing like that. There was nothing like that, and nobody talk about it. And uh, the people with emotions, they were saying, uh, "Why not we have curfew? Why we not we declare emergency and all that?" But we, we people who knew it, and the IG was there, and we said. No, nothing actually. I <coughs> suggested there is no requirement because I was getting uh, the situation to <coughs> moment by moment, uh, the running commentary of the situation of the country. I was getting through my intelligence services and operational people. I have been feeding that to the other service commanders as well. And I realized there was nothing, you know, the absolute uh, calm, uh, calm uh, <coughs> was prevailing at that time in the country. There was no requirement, I felt, and I said there is no requirement of curfew, no requirement of emergency from our point of view, but uh, I suggested if at all if it is required you take legal advice from people and do it. That was my suggestion. There was no talk of retaining power? Absolutely no talk of retaining power, even if at all it was there, no, we wouldn't have agreed with it. But uh, there was no, uh, any moment that anybody discussed about retaining power. Uh, 
case. This is absolute uh, complicated story. But General, uh, one thing that, that led to this is General Fonseca has actually gone on record saying about the, the troop formation that you all brought in troops from, from outstation. Uh, and they were, what he says is pointed to that they were Gajabar regiment troops who were brought in. So obviously there was a connection drawn that the Gajabar regiment with the former defence secretary there was a close connection. What was this troop formation about? Why were the tro these troops called into Colombo? That's according to the <coughs> normal practice of uh, democratic uh, government. And this is not the first time uh, the troops are brought into place uh, to assist the police uh, during elections. It has been the uh, uh, case uh, uh, all the time uh, in this country. And this time also a similar thing happened. It is, uh, it is actually, it was planned by the uh, Chief of Defence Staff on the request of the police and the Election Commission and to deploy troops. And the police requested uh, actually 48 or 70 or 2 hours before uh, the troops started uh, taking over the places that the police was guarding, the uh, important uh, places in the country giving security to important people in the country, army was doing that based on the request of the police and police had to withdraw people to send for the election. This was agreed and this was not a secret thing. Uh, this was discussed at the uh, Chief of Defence Staff Office and the master plan was done. According to that plan, the plan was sent out to the Army, Navy, Air Force and Police Headquarters. This, uh, this was sent in writing well before the election day and uh, according to the plan the commanders were appointed to the commander's operation the chief of defense staff became the chief commander uh, the top commander controlling the entire election operation then army appointed general sumedhapur as the army rep and similarly air force navy and police appointed their reps to, uh, to be the uh, commanders like that there's a chain of command came down it is a uh, then the command, uh, special commanders were appointed to, especially the Colombo situation, similarly not only Colombo and even other areas. Uh, quite a normal thing, it is nothing uh, unusual in it. But when the military, um, this kind of operations are planned, we, we classify it as secret. All the documents that we send uh, classify as secret. Uh, this is not only a unique moment, but it is, it is the normal practice of the military. So it happened this time too, uh, and it uh, it's, uh, the, uh, it was planned, they implemented, and happily managed. So, uh, General, can you categorically say, as the as the army commander who was, who was heading the army at that time, there was no influence from the defence secretary to bring in these troops and to station them in the event of, of retaining power? No, not for us. Not uh, to us. Uh, you know, it is a normal thing. Defence Secretary, if at all, if they would have given instructions to Chief of Defence Staff. And this is not uh, Defence Secretary, this, uh, this, actually, this, these things discussed at the Defence uh, uh, Security Council. And well before the election, two, three, uh, uh, even during the election and another thing, the Security Council was discussing the, the, the situation. Based on that only you come to agreement, okay, we will uh, have a deployment like this. This, this is the common practice. And uh, about the Gajaba, then yes, there were a fair number of Gajaba battalions, uh, Gajaba officers uh, got involved. And this uh, instruction uh, came from Chief of Defence Staff to us. And uh, so it is uh, not only Gajaba, but uh, there are other battalions as well. We would have had fair number. Uh, so there were Gajaba battalions within that as well. So you are saying there is nothing suspicious generally? Nothing thing? suspicious according to the us. Right. General, uh, one thing that uh, during this, I am asking these questions because these are questions that people have uh, people have had all around after, after, after the conclusion of the election. One thing was general that why this question comes about, this Gajaba regiment question comes about is because there was a feeling in this country that the defence secretary who was very powerful at the time had an unfettered access to the army. What is your view of the politicization of the army? Was there any sort of politicization of the army? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And this is how people fabricate uh, stories and those who don't have confidence, those who have vested interest, those who have been rejected from the military. And these are people making allegations. And they are the people who are trying to politicize the military professional decisions being criticized in the political 
uh, stage and trying to politicize these uh, professional decisions, uh, this has been happening in the past. Uh, so this is a bad story. It is not the military getting politicized, no, the military professional decisions being discussed away from the military and Gajaba is one good regiment and they played a very important role during the crucial moments in this country and from the inception today they have been doing a marvelous, extremely important job. There are very good officers and those are very good soldiers and similarly other regiments as well. So then, then no one was talking about Sri Lanka right. light infantry because I belong to that infantry. I would have heard. There were light infantry battalions. There were Singha regiment battalions. There were Vijayabha regiment battalions. You look at these things and people who are talking, the media, the responsible people in this country, without listening to somebody uh, only, uh, coming into conclusion, this is the bad part. This is the uh, sorry state of affairs here. Uh, people must look at these things. Uh, these are, I mean, you can talk to the people and see whether there was any special interest in being a special regiment. No, it is not. There were the reflection of the military getting involved in that. Just because someone is saying, don't believe these things and go and ask the military, responsible military people. And our military spokesman was saying uh, the, the number of battalions coming and the names of those battalions, which regiment they belong to. I saw he was uh, uh, telling all these things. But people do not believe uh, these things. They want to believe something um, uh, that someone is saying. And with these allegations only they try, tend to believe. But general people, those who understand all these things, will really understand the reality. But general, as, as the army commander who is there for, about, for over a year, uh, and who was second in command before that. Uh, General, can you categorically say that Mr. Rajapaksha Gotabi Rajapaksha did not have a direct influence towards the army? Was Why not? He's the defense secretary. Right. He always had direct influence. So, not only the army, Navy and Air Force, and he had done a yeoman service to this country as far as the defense is concerned. And the uh, training, equipping uh, the army, training the army, the structure in the army, professional lines in the army, the capacity building of the army, and in all aspects he had influence. But was that job. politicization? Uh, no, politicization. Did, did he appoint people that only only who would, who were yes men to him? That is one allegation. No. That is. This army was becoming very very professional day by day, and you see from. I can tell you for last four or five years I was at Army headquarters number two and then became number one and the amount of things that we have done is yeoman service and uh, enormous the, the jobs that we have done because 30 years of war and, and when we started um, before the war, 30 years before we had only 10,000 people in the army, number, uh, number. today we have around 200,000. So this evolution um, actually did not happen according to a proper plan as and when we wanted people, we recruited. As a result, after the war, we had an uh, enormous amount of problems. So we developed a master plan to uh, systemize the whole thing. And we carried out a thing called administrative inspection. And through that, for about two to three years, we carried out and we really uh, put the system into an order. So then uh, we, we, we were uh, doing uh, professionally uh, uh, size in the army and uh, reorganizing the army, restructuring the army, uh, retraining the people uh, to suit uh, today's and the future requirement. Based on that, we have uh, <coughs> professionally uh, doing it extremely well. And it is all these things were done uh, on the instructions of the uh, Secretary to the Minister of Defense. All whatever the changes. Uh, uh, high level changes and uh, structural changes. Uh, we, we were discussing with uh, Secretary of Defense, and, and even those discussions only we have uh, come to conclusions and implemented these things. His involvement was throughout uh, there for the best interest of the country. Another issue that has, that has come about within the past one month or more than that is that during the election, I bet you and the CDS, Chief of Defence Staff, played a crucial role within the army in order to support the former regime. Did you support the former regime and did you ask your troops to support the former regime? This is all, uh, it's another fabricated joke actually. And because uh, <coughs> people are saying that uh, 
we have been going around the country and telling the people to vote against, uh, vote for uh, a particular party. And these are all fabricated sto <coughs> stories. I feel sorry about these uh, people who are believing these things. People who are alleg making allegations, I have no uh, problem because you can't expect uh, <coughs> anything more from these people. Uh, but uh, those who believe these things, I uh, feel sorry about it because there was nothing like that happened. Because <coughs> traditionally, the commander addressed the troops during towards the beginning and end of a uh, uh, year, then army day, then uh, comes basically new year day or a particular regiment's day and all that, so army commander goes and address troops. And this has been the practice in the past, but uh, during the time of conflict and these things were not there. So uh, when I became the commander, <coughs> so what I was trying to put these good practices in the army into the practice. So as a result, I was going around and speaking to the soldiers regularly. I was visiting the camps regularly. I was re visiting the field areas regularly. This has been going on. I was visiting the first time in the history uh, after the conflict was over. And uh, <coughs> I started uh, visiting regiments. I started visiting uh, formations. So these things happen. So during the month of December, January, and even well before that, it has been happening, it was regularly happening. And so towards the end also I went around the camps and I spoke to the soldiers. Yes, I did. I went to uh, seven, eight places, not to all the places. Centrally, uh, you go to a special, uh, I mean, Singapore's area and you go and address, you take a cross-section of people and address. That is the practice. So this practice was carried out. During that, I, uh, so these uh, speeches, uh, audio and vi uh, video Record. uh, recorded and uh, you can see what I have spoken and so some very professional military speeches and, and uh, not many people those who are making allegations can go in front of uh, soldiers and talk also they don't have that capacity I have that capacity I did that very well I have been motivating soldiers by speaking to soldiers like this so this practice I've been practicing I have been practicing and this is what happened. Then <coughs> there was uh, another allegation to say that uh, we distributed a leaflet. And <laughs> these are all, once again, uh, very uh, petty things, actually. Um, uh, the, uh, there was a practice, and soldier, uh, I mean, regularly soldier, and head of the bath with his pay, he get the pay slip. So what the army headquarters does, um, if they want to send something, a message to the soldier, uh, they uh, print that message uh, on the uh, opposite side of the pay slip and send to the soldiers. This was not uh, properly uh, done. I did not agree with this. And then what I said, okay, we develop a nice leaflet, and we with the pay packet, we pay slip, we used to send that slip. So this had been going on for over one year. So then uh, what happened? The uh, end of the year. We summarize the whole thing and send it to the soldiers. This has been, uh, been a practice. So this practice uh, was carried out. And so people were looking at things always uh, from a political uh, uh, angle. They would have seen this as a political leaflet. No, it is. There is no politics at all. You can see these things. You can, these are available. And I think you must read these things, you must see these things and um, see whether it has anything to do with politics or it was normal military uh, practice. Uh, there was this, um, the, the appointments of, of new military officers uh, while you were army commander, there was uh, a list of names sent to you. Were you aware of this list? Uh, as is, uh, Actually, um, this uh, happened and I got a list uh, one evening, I got a list of uh, Ten names reinstate uh, the uh, ten officers. That is it. And then there was another list uh, of seven names giving uh, specific appointments to those officers. So this came from the presidential secretariat. Uh, then came to the defense secretary. Defense secretary sent it to me directly. And uh, next day um, I uh, implemented. So I, uh, I was instructed to implement it uh, with immediate effect. 
So I did it. And that is how uh, the, maybe the list that you are referring. So is it a good thing, General? Do you think that this no, such practice is... it's not a good practice, actually. The officers, uh, other than the chief of army, and all of the appointments, uh, basically the army uh, command uh, does. Of course, senior appointments, when it comes, we always uh, having like security force commanders, principal staff officers, and all that army uh, minister of defense had been given instructions to us when those appointments are uh, uh, before the announcement of the appointments. Uh, there is a board uh, ships and the board proceedings uh, to be discussed with the secretary of defense. That has been the practice. Uh, it has been the practice in the army. Uh, I mean, Navy, of course, all three services actually. Um, but the army command published. That is how it happens. So this was a little um, away from the common practice. Uh, this directly came from, for the first time, came from the presidential secretariat. These names, yes. Yeah, and are you fearful of the of the future of the army, the, uh, general? As as you all have developed, as you are saying, you know, you've developed it, it and we've seen that. Yeah, you, that um, uh, I think uh, army <coughs> is going on nicely. And um, we have made it a very, very professional outfit today. And I'm very happy and uh, I'm sure this will continue. I wish them good luck. And we have some very good officers in the military and who will do a very good job. And uh, they will do a very professional job. However much people trying to <laughs> disorganize it, how much people interested groups, elements, uh, because over the years we know that a lot of people are trying to even LTT and other people, so then people who are working against the government and all that, so they were trying to disrupt the, uh, disorganize the military. This is uh, basically uh, the, uh, the issue we had. So military is basically the keeping the country together. Military has always been the binding uh, force. Yeah, so, do you think that could happen, General? Like now the way it is going since this... So this will uh, maintain. This maintain. Will, uh, maintain. That is the thing that we all together will make sure that it will happen. And we must not allow any uh, unwanted people getting uh, involved with the military. This is the thing that uh, educated people in this country, influential people in this country, right-thinking people of this country must not allow this discounted element to get involved with the military because military has become a very, very professional outfit today. This must uh, be improved further uh, because, uh, you know, after 30 years of protracted conflict and what happened around the world is that uh, military is uh, <coughs> somewhat become a burden to a nation, but here it is not so. Sri Lanka, even today, uh, everybody respect, everybody has the highest respect uh, for the military officers, military soldiers, for the military. And uh, uh, they have the highest confidence uh, on the military. Uh, we must improve this uh, further, not allow anybody to disrupt this. Okay. General, you cannot answer this question if you don't want to, but what is actually, General Fonseca also was a former army commander, he commanded the army. What was actually why is why do you think he's, he's raising these concerns? He co continues to raise these concerns in the media mm -hmm. about the politicization of the military. He kept, you know, we, we've heard. Uh, actually, I don't want to argue with someone who has uh, uh, no right thinking capacity. Uh, I don't want to argue with this kind of people. And this, uh, you can't expect anything more from an uh, individual like this. And um, I don't agree with uh, most of the things what he is saying. Uh, but uh, as I told you, the, <coughs> I don't think uh, the good uh, professional military officers will allow this kind of things to happen in the military. Right. So now moving on, as the as the uh, you were in charge of uh, resettlement, can you just take us through? You know that was your your, your resettlement, uh, not recent. I'm sorry, rehabilitation was commendable. And how did you change from a war man who was leading a war to to a man who? Cool. Yeah, this transforming Trans the uh, terrorist to most dangerous people to be most uh, disciplined people in the society. This was the rehabilitation process. And when I was given the job, and uh, I went around the world to find a solution to this, uh, but I could not find a proper uh, 
system. So then we sat together and I went around and I read uh, many uh, rehabilitation projects, programs developed by many countries and organizations, international uh, ICRC, things like that. So I uh, realized that there was a vacuum in that and um, in order to fill that we developed a new concept called 6 plus 1 uh, concept. So that we developed, uh, that was a comprehensive one through our intuition we could do that and we the experience we had and all that, so I consulted many people and uh, we developed a proper master plan to uh, a rehabilitation project process. So we implemented that uh, properly, managed it well and we managed to reintegrate around now 14,000 ex-combatants into the society after sending them through a proper rehabilitation program. The success uh, that is that uh, none of those 14,000 or people who have been reintegrated living in, in the society for the last four or five years, have, uh, none of them have resorted to uh, violence. None of them have resorted to extremist activities. None of those people have resorted to even normal antisocial activity. So this is the success. So nowhere in the world you have had uh, this kind of success. So now it is going on well, and now it is at the last stage. Only very few people are few people are remaining. Uh, it is happening very well, as you said. And uh, general, as the commander of the army, if you can run us through briefly, as the commander of the army, what 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 did you overlook, and what were the the new initiatives that you brought into the army, and what what are you most proud of during this one and a half? Yeah, there are many things. You know that uh, over 30 years of war, the army evolved to be one of the uh, it became the biggest organization in the country and. So during the time of uh, conflict, uh, based on the requirement during that particular period of time, uh, based on situations, facing the circumstances and all that army was uh, coming up and uh, the whole evolution process had taken place. But after the uh, war ended in 2010, I was appointed as the chief of uh, staff in the army. Basically, chief of staff job is to uh, manage the army. Uh, <coughs> look into the all administrative, logistic, the sports and uh, welfare and activities of the army, structural changes, training requirements, capacity building and all that comes under the purview of uh, uh, the chief of the staff of the army. So I developed, as I told you earlier, I developed a master plan after having discussions with uh, the people after going through how other armies in the world have faced this kind of situation, post-conflict situations and all that after doing a proper research, we develop a, once again a proper master plan to be implemented. That was implemented uh, within about uh, two to three years. We <coughs> introduced a lot of changes into the army uh, and restructured the whole uh, army into a, uh, a proper uh, outfit to suit the present and future requirements. Then we <coughs> developed the training system, we introduced new training systems to suit today's and future requirements. Then we developed a capacity building program, you know, over the years officers have been uh, taken into the army and during the uh, uh, 20, about 20-25 years uh, we have concentrated uh, mainly skill development only which was required for the war fighting and after that because training system in the army not only skill development but developing uh, the knowledge, the enhancing knowledge. So this uh, thing, that portion was not properly given the proper priority because of the uh, requirement of, uh, during that time. So now we enhance that and we develop this uh, capacity and we have uh, introduce a lot of new things to, uh, to develop the uh, enhance uh, the, the capacity of the officers, the develop the knowledge and the skills of the officers and so forth. Likewise, training system then comes to the welfare system of the army. We have uh, revolutionized the entire welfare system in the country and the army. Then uh, the, the sports field, we have done a superb master plan and we have a lot of uh, talents identification of talents to the <coughs> put them into proper system. Uh, those things are uh, uh, on a very, very professional uh, way. We have looked into all those uh, things. So this is where I see 
the future is uh, if we continue to uh, go ahead with this one, uh, we then <coughs> we uh, did the research and uh, developed a master plan and projected to the government to build in the army because national security and development must go hand in hand. The government is very happy and um, they allocated money uh, to develop uh, this master plan we projected like this. So these are very good achievements. Then going beyond uh, that, uh, the, the contribution that we can give to the nation uh, within the capacity available, the management practices uh, in the army available. So from this capacity, what with the Unicity Children Program, like right? uh, Unicity, we introduce a program on the request of the, uh, the education and ministry and from the President Secretariat. Uh, we introduce a <coughs> training system, you know, that uh, leadership and uh, positive thinking uh, package to the entire university students in the country. And this was uh, actually I got involved in developing the master plan. I implemented it under my uh, leadership uh, with, from the military. We introduce. Uh, there are so many such programs that we that develop and introduce. I am very happy that I, within a very short span of time, one and a half years of my command, I find that it is, uh, it is a superb service to uh, for the uh, uh, betterment of the Sri Lanka Army, to professionalize the Sri Lanka Army, and uh, <coughs> to introduce a lot of uh, proper practices into the Sri Lanka Army. And today it is accepted by the entire soldier officer community of the army. They are very happy about the changes that we introduce. And I am also very happy that I could be able to do a service to the nation before I uh, left the service that I like. And from the childhood, I wanted to be an army officer. I achieved that and <coughs> I reached the highest uh, level. And today I am leaving uh, after receiving the highest rank of the military uh, in the world today. Thank you, General. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure and a pleasure.